Άρα είμαστε έτσι. Αυτό το Αυτό είναι ο κομμιδητή. Θέλω να είμαι κομμιδητή όμως, για να είμαι κομμιδητής εκεί. So we are ready to start. Okay, ready to take the place. So it is a pleasure to have uh, with us today Dr. Dimitris Tamatelos. Uh, as you see, he's coming from the University of Central Lancashire, where he is a uh, reader, associate professor. Uh, he has uh, he got his uh, bachelor degree here in Athens uh, from the University of Athens and his master's uh, from the Rice University in the US. Uh, his PhD has been uh, uh, completed at the Cardiff University, UK. And then uh, he started a series of uh, postdoc positions. Uh, first, uh, again, at the University of Athens as laboratory instructor, then research associate at the Cardiff University. He was a research fellow at the University of Central Lancashire, visiting fellow of, uh, at the University of Nagoya in Japan. Uh, and since uh, 2018, he is, uh, as I said before, a reader, associate professor at the University of Central Lancashire. Uh, the title of his talk is already on the screen, you can see, and we are glad to, to listen to your talk. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to, to be here and give you this talk about uh, the work I, I've been doing in this exciting field of uh, exoplanets. Uh, we know uh, planets for a really long time. In fact, it was the ancients that discovered the first planets, the first five planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Uh, initially, Earth was not part of this club, and uh, Aristarchos. Uh, Uh, in the ancient times and much later, Copernicus in the Renaissance uh, era added uh, Earth as the sixth planet. Then we, of course, we had the discoveries of the planets uh, in the outer edges of our solar system in the last uh, couple of centuries. Uh, and that was pretty much the state of play in this field until 1995, where 51 Pegasi B, the first exoplanet around a solar type star was discovered. And since there, kind of uh, many, many discoveries followed. And in the last uh, three decades, we have discovered uh, around 5,000 uh, exoplanets. The first uh, couple of hundred exoplanets were discovered by the radial velocity method. So in this method, uh, you see the effect of the planet on the star. Um, so because the star, uh, the, the planet goes around the star, uh, also the planet exerts a, a force of the star, the star makes a little movement. Of course, you cannot really see uh, the planet uh, uh, move, uh, the star moving, but uh, uh, we can observe its spectrum and you can see the lines uh, blue shifted or red shifted, uh, depending on whether the, the, the star moving towards us or away from us. So we're able to discuss this uh, velocity, uh, radial velocity diagram that I have down here. Uh, and then from the shape of this velocity diagram, we can get information about the planet. By far the most successful uh, method was the, the transit method. Again, an indirect method, uh, the planet passes in front of the star and makes the luminosity of the star drop by a very tiny amount. Um, and uh, 
most of the planets, as I said, discovered by this method, and that's due to the Kepler Space Telescope that uh, um, observed a large number of stars and discovered uh, actually most of the exoplanets that we know today. Uh, discovering an exoplanet is, I mean, observing an exoplanet, if you know where to look, is, is not very difficult. Uh, you can do it even from the ground with kind of a medium-sized telescope, even with uh, binoculars. But the problem is to know where to look. So that's what Kepler did, the space telescope Kepler. It just observed hundreds of thousands of stars uh, for a long time to try to find uh, this, this exoplanet. And now uh, this uh, uh, history of discovery continues with uh, the successor of Kepler, uh, which is called TESS, the Trusting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, uh, which covers, observes a much larger uh, area of the sky and so far has discovered uh, uh, 200 confirmed planets, has another 5,500 candidates and is expected to discover more than 20,000 new planets. From what we know so far, I think that the most important aspect of all these exoplanet observations is that the properties of the exoplanets are very diverse. And I will try to demonstrate this by constructing this diagram where I have the semi-major axis of the planet on the x-axis and the planet mass in units of Jupiter mass on the y-axis. So these are the terrestrial planets in our solar system, and these are the giant planets. And here is the, the, are the observed exoplanets. You see, this, these planets are nothing like our solar system. We have this uh, category of uh, big planets, Jupiter mass planets orbiting very close to the star, much closer than the orbit of Mercury here in our solar system. And notice this is a logarithmic graph, so they're very, very close to the central star. And they're named hot Jupiters because by being so close to the star, they're, they're heated uh, at a, a relatively high temperatures. Then you have this uh, category of planets, the white orbit giant planets. They have observed planets, even a few thousand astronomical units away from the, from the, from the star, from the whole star. And then we have the super Earths or mini Neptunes, depending on what is their composition. And finally, we have a few Earths down here. So there are things in this graph that are real. For example, the, the gap between this group here, the whole Jupiters and what is, Called here the eccentric giants. So if there were more planets here, we would be we should be able to have discovered them. Uh, but also there are other uh, aspects of this graph. For example, the lack of Earth down here. They're just due to observational biases. Earths are very uh, uh, difficult to observe because they have relatively low mass and the effect on the parent star is is minimal. So the two methods that we have used so far, the most important methods, transit and radial velocity are not uh, sensitive to this type of planets. And of course, there may be many more planets, many Earth's lower mass planets in this region of the graph here. Uh, by the way, can you see my arrow when I do this? Yes, we can. <laughs> okay, good, yes. good. Okay, that's great. Uh, so from this uh, discovery, there are many uh, uh, surprises, and that came from the uh, first uh, discovery, uh, 51 Pegasi B. So these are the hot Jupiters, very um, uh, big planets close to the star. We don't have this planet in our solar system, of course. How do they form there? That's uh, uh, something that uh, the theorists are trying to, to uh, find out. Also, we had planets around binary stars. Uh, like this uh, Kepler 16b planet, uh, and also planets on wide orbits, uh, as I mentioned when I discovered the, discussed the graph. Here is the first system that was discovered, and actually with uh, direct detection. So these planets are relatively massive and quite far away from the star. So these are the only planets you can actually, <coughs> excuse me, see uh, directly. So you have here one, two, three, four planets. We've observed this system for more than 15 years now, so we can make this, this nice movie. So each of these planets is about 10 times the mass of Jupiter and orbit from distances 15 to uh, 70 astronomical units. In comparison, Jupiter orbits just at five astronomical units away from the, from, from the sun. And also, uh, 
can call it like the holy grail in exoplanet discoveries is to discover planets in the habitable zone uh, of a star. And the habitable zone is defined in the region around the star where liquid, the temperature is, is right for liquid water to exist. And that's about one astronomical, one astronomical unit in our solar system. Mars is just outside this habitable zone. It's a bit too cold. Uh, Venus is a bit uh, um, uh, closer, uh, just outside the inner edge of the habitable zone. So it's just too hot. But if you go to smaller mass star, they're less luminous. So you need to go closer to the star in order um, to, be, to, to find the habitable zone. So for a 10%, so 30%, uh, a star with 30% the mass of the sun, this is about 0.1 AU, so uh, very, very close, the orbit of Mercury. And quite a few planets have been discovered in the habitable zone. Uh, I think maybe one of the most interesting ones is the, the planets that were discovered around uh, the system TRAPPIST-1. Trappist so this is a, a very small star, red dwarf, with mass about 10% the mass of the sun. And seven planets actually have been discovered around this system and three of them are within the habitable zone. And finally, my, my favorite one, uh, you know about the uh, system that is closest to, to the sun, the Alpha Centauri system that consists of two more or less solar type stars, Alpha Centauri A and uh, Alpha Centauri B, that in a, it's a tight binary. And a few hundred away, a few hundred uh, AU away from it is the Proxima Centauri, a red dwarf, again, about 10% the mass of the star of the sun, which is at this point of time, the closest star to the earth. And around that in 2016, the planet was discovered that is uh, within its, this habitable zone. And since then, two more planets have been discovered in this uh, system that is closest to, to our sun. So a lot of uh, discoveries are happening in the last few years that makes this field, uh, this field quite exciting. Uh, so how do we think uh, planets uh, form? Uh, and this is uh, the, the area that we're working on. Um, a general impression is that planets form more or less the same uh, time as the star forms. And this is a cartoon picture of uh, how things star formation proceeds. So you have a molecular cloud, which is quite big, and some parts of this cloud, this course, become uh, gravitationally stable and collapse. And this is shown here in the second uh, um, um, panel. And because of some initial rotation or some turbulent motions of this cloud, uh, uh, you don't form just a star, just a, but you also form a disk around the star uh, that is seen here. At these initial stages, there is still quite a lot of envelope, kind of this dark region. So it's quite difficult to see this, this structure here, the star with the disk. But then the envelope dissipates uh, eventually and, you, and you're left over with a very well um, observed disk and some uh, bipolar outflow, some ejection of material perpendicular to the disk. And then finally, this disk dissipates. This disk, in this disk is where planets form and the disk eventually dissipates. And what you left is with the planetary system. Okay, this is a cartoon picture, but there are observations that are um, uh, kind of support this picture. So you have the pre-stellar cores, very cold objects, about 10K temperature that are the precursor of stars. Then you have the class zero and one objects. There are embedded phase of star formation. And then you have the class two and class three objects. And this is one of my simulations showing this uh, exactly how this star formation happens. So here I plot the collapsing, uh, the center of a collapsing molecular cloud. You can see a star forms here and the disk forms around it. And the disk is fed with material from the, from the envelope here. Just to measure, this is a few hundred AU across. And then this disk becomes unstable and fragments to form uh, companion stars and also brown dwarfs in this case. So the standard uh, theory of planet formation is that planets form from uh, dust coagulation to progressively larger and larger particles. So you start with uh, micrometer size dust, sand like we have in, in the beaches, then this collides to form pebbles, eventually form planetesimals, kilometer size objects, and eventually planets. And this cartoon picture up here in the, the dark color corresponds to dust, to dust and the white, uh, the, 
and the light color corresponds to gas. So about 90% of discs are composed of gas and this 1% of dust. And initially gas and dust are very well mixed. It's like you're in the room and you're running around. So dust is all over the place. But then eventually when you stop moving, then dust falls down onto the, onto the, onto the, um, onto the ground. And the ground in this case is the disc mid place. So dust concentrates on the disc mid plane. And then that increases the dust um, density, number density. So dust particles collide with each other to form uh, progressively larger and larger bodies. And there is still a remaining gaseous disk, as you see here and here. And then some part of this disk is accreted when the core, this core is, is high enough, is accreted onto this core, to this planet, to form the gas giant planets that we know today. Uh, the problem with this process is that it takes a few million years to, to happen from this dust for this dust coagulation. And uh, observations of protostellar disks show that may, we may not have that much time for, for planets to form. So observations show that disks live only for uh, maybe a few million years. And that uh, provides a tight constraint for the formation of planets. The alternative uh, formation theory is the one I'm working on. It's called uh, uh, disk fragmentation or alternative gravitational instability. So you have a disk that is relatively massive enough. So these spiral arms form, and if the conditions are right, these spiral arms can break up into pieces, can fragment to form uh, the planets. Uh, and the um, uh, advantage of this, uh, of this uh, method, this uh, theory, is that it can form planets on a dynamical time scale, which in this case is on the order of a few uh, tens of thousands of years. So you can form planets very, very fast, and actually large planets very fast. And there are two conditions for this fragment. First of all, uh, the tumor criteria needs to be satisfied. So the disk needs to be massive enough. It was actually a criteria that was first um, uh, devised for galactic disk, but also applies for protostellar disks. So what we have here in this, uh, this uh, inequality, uh, the tumor parameter Q needs to be less than one. So what you have here in the numerator is the sound speed that acts as a proxy for thermal support for the disk uh, omega, the rotation of the disk, the rotational velocity, which acts uh, it's a proxy for rotational support. And what you have at the denominator is the surface density of the disk, sigma, which uh, is a proxy of gravity. So if gravity wins, basically the, uh, uh, the disk can become uh, unstable. And it, that was basically known for a pretty long time, but in the last uh, couple of decades, it was realized that uh, this is not a, a, a sufficient requirement. You also need the disk to be able to cool uh, fast enough for, for fragmentation to happen. So if, you have a, if the disk becomes unstable and uh, a clump starts forming in the disk, then the clump will start contracting, trying to form the planet. But from this construction, uh, gravitational energy is transformed into heat. Okay, so this heat, this uh, thermal energy of the clump needs to be radiated away or else it will become too important and it will stop the collapse. And the combination of these two conditions leads to the um, discovery that uh, this can fragment only at uh, large distances from the stellar uh, central star, talking about 70 to about 100 astronomical units away. So in order to uh, simulate the process of disk fragmentation, you need to include some radiative uh, uh, transfer in, in hydrodynamic simulations. And this uh, traditionally uh, um, is done by uh, using the parameterized radiative cooling. So you say that uh, the cooling at a specific point in the disk is just a, a, a fraction of the uh, orbital period. So it's a, it's a there's no physical uh, justification behind this, it's just a, a parameter study. But more kind of advanced models use some uh, approximate uh, radiative transfer uh, methods in order to uh, capture the physical processes that happens in disks. And this is one of the methods that I have, uh, have developed, where I include the detailed dust and gas opacities and also an equation of state that in includes uh, the vibration and uh, rotational decrease of uh, freedom of molecular hydrogen. And also a uh, very important thing, the dissociation of molecular hydrogen uh, at about uh, 2000 K. 
Okay, this is one of, uh, of my simulations that shows the typical uh, outcome of uh, disk fragmentation. So you have here a, a quite massive disk. Uh, it's about 80% the mass of the central star. You can see spiral arms form quickly and they fragment to give you a few objects. Some of these objects that form, they are planets, other they are brown dwarfs, a bit, uh, they have a bit larger masses. So typically in the simulations, we form from three to about 12 objects. So there is interactions between these objects. Some of these are rejected away. So this one is gone perpendicular to the, to the screen here. Um, and then you can see those two combining out here. So if you probably you didn't notice the time up here, given years, but everything happens quite fast. You see within 11,000 years, we have the disk fragmenting and give you all these objects uh, in the, uh, uh, around the central star. So this fragmentation can happen very fast uh, and it's, it's needed if we, if we want to explain the early, very early formation of planets. So is it uh, uh, relevant to planet formation? I think there are a few clues that uh, lead us to this direction. First of all is the presence of uh, white orbit planets. Um, like the four planet system that discovered, I, I discussed earlier, HR 8799. So this is the system here. So you have uh, planets at the uh, hundreds of, uh, sorry, tens of uh, AU away from the star, masses 10 Jupiter masses. The standard formation theory, the dust coagulation to, to larger and larger bodies does not work well. It's less and less efficient the further away you go from the star. So it's impossible to form these planets by uh, the, standard, the, the standard model of, of planet formation. And also these uh, this, uh, distances uh, that we see these objects from uh, let's say 20 to about 70 years where this fragmentation can actually uh, work well. So here uh, we have uh, uh, snaps of the part of mere simulations. You see when you go very close to the star, okay, here I have it at 100 AU, actually maybe it's about 70 to 60 AU, and that can go a bit lower, a bit, uh, bit uh, higher. You don't form anything because the disk simply cannot cool enough. And then you form many objects from about 100 to 300 AU. And that's the region basically where both of uh, the conditions for fragmentation are satisfied. So you need to have Tumor parameter less than one. So it's this region here. <clears throat> and you also need to have cooling time uh, below 0 0.5, the period of the planet. So it's just down here. And the second clue uh, that planet disk instability is formation is the um, um, observations of disks that show that planets may be forming much faster than we previously thought. As I said, the early uh, star formation phase where the star is still embedded in its molecular cloud is quite difficult to observe. But in the last uh, 10 years or so, we have the Atacama Large Millimeter Array operating uh, from the um, uh, surface uh, uh, desert in, uh, in Chile. It's a, uh, an array of 66 uh, DCs uh, connected together uh, and they give us uh, extremely good resolution and very good sensitivity to observe uh, uh, stars that are embedded within their envelopes. And these stars contain disks. And this was actually the first of this observation that came from ALMA, uh, the system of HL tau. So for the first time here, we had the opportunity to see this structure within this. Because before we had ALMA, the, this, this disk was appeared kind of like smooth without any structure. But here you see these dark lanes here, these bright rings that uh, are around the, around the star that is here. Initially, okay, the, the first interpretation of this is that, okay, you have a planet forming here, let's say in this, in this dark lane that goes around and clear the gap. So some people say there are planets already here. Some other people say that planets are not there yet. They're just forming all these bright rings. And also there are some other people that say that this, there are no planets at all here, just some other dynamical effects that create these gaps. But I think the most uh, um, plausible scenario for this formation of these gaps is that you have some planets forming. And we're talking about a very young disk here. So that tells us that planets must form uh, quite fast. And since this uh, first observation, there are many observations of other disks too. 
that's all these uh, rings and uh, bright patterns are very common. So you see it in this uh, in four of these kind of uh, six images that I have here. So this is, if I remember well, yeah, this is DW Hydra. It's a relatively older disk. Um, and then you also have this type of spiral arms here that also may be indicative of the presence of a planet. Uh, there can be a planet, for example, out here going around and exciting these spiral arms. And also another common um, configuration, a common structure that we see from this early disk is this crescent-like features here that again uh, could be formed due to planets creating vortices within the disks. And this one that came uh, relatively recently, about a year and a half ago, it, it's the, the, air, the, the youngest disk observed so far that shows some uh, signs of these uh, gaps and rings. Okay, these are a bit difficult to see. Okay, you have to have a bit of imagination and just follow this, uh, relax your eye, and maybe you can see kind of a dark lane here. And this is a very young uh, disk, it's about 100,000 to 500,000 years old. So basically, this tells us that the process that, start, that, that leads to the formation of the planets have started very early on. And also, this, uh, this, uh, this is also another uh, important uh, discovery that shows a, a gravitationally stable disk. Uh, and relatively high. When I start doing these simulations of disks, uh, I, I, I did simulations of very extended, large, and very massive disks. And uh, people were a bit skeptical about accepting those because they say, okay, disks are not that, that big. But here I had this observation that basically saw uh, very similar things that I'm uh, simulating. So here we have a binary system in the center, which is about one solar mass. The disk is very big, about 400 AU in size, in, dia in, uh, in radius and its mass is about 30% the mass of the central star. And then you can see this spiral arm here and signs of another fragment, another uh, object forming here at the spiral arm. And also there are other signs of uh, uh, massive disks. And this is uh, the Elias 227 system. Again, you see these kind of spiral arms that are indicative of the uh, really a uh, very mass, a uh, very large mass of this disk. So there are, uh, although I think definitely uh, disk fragmentation, uh, disk instability uh, is relevant to plant formation, uh, there are some problems with uh, the theory. And the first problem is that uh, in most cases, it forms objects that are more massive than planets. So if you go to the low mass end uh, regime, we have three types of objects. First of all, we have stars uh, that burn hydrogen and the limit, the hydrogen burning limit is about uh, 80 Jupiter masses. That's about 0 0.08 uh, solar masses. And then you have uh, objects that are called brown dwarfs uh, that they not burn uh, hydrogen, but they can burn deuterium and the deuterium burning limit is 13 Jupiter masses down here. And then you have planets that can actually do not burn uh, anything. Okay, well, when you go to, to the boundaries of this region, you see they're kind of very similar in size and probably in properties. So the, when you, uh, uh, in the simulations, you see that when you form on the disk fragments, all the objects start with a mass that is in the planetary mass regime. So here, what I do is I plot the mass of the object form versus the distance from the star. Uh, here I plot about 100 objects that are formed in 12 different simulations. So that shows what happens at the formation. So everything more or less is below the 13 Jupiter mass uh, boundary here. So all of them, all of these objects that form in the disk start as planets. But still there's a lot of gas in the disk and as this planets, protoplanets go around, they accrete quite a lot of gas. So after 15,000 years, you see most of them have become brown dwarfs. They are in this region here. And quite a few of them, about 25%, uh, if I remember well, they have become low mass stars. So if you form, if you manage to have a disk that has the right conditions to fragment, you need to find a way to uh, stop the growth of uh, these protoplanets so they can remain planets and not become higher mass objects. 
The second problem is uh, the migration problem. So if you form a, a planet, let's say at about a uh, hundred uh, AU uh, in a very massive disk, then the planet interacts with the disk, loses angular momentum and can fall onto the star. And this was one of the early simulations that were done about this issue. Um, what they did, so here is distance from the star on the y-axis versus time. The simulation started with a planet at 100 AU. And you see quite quickly the planet moves inwards and uh, at the inner boundary of the computational domain. And that happened within 1,000 years here, maybe 10,000 years. So effectively, if, if you have, if, if this is correct here, that means that if you form a planet in a very massive disk, it will basically migrate inwards very fast and probably fall into the star and get destroyed. So these are the kind of the two main problems that I've been uh, uh, thinking about the last uh, five years or so. Uh, if you form a protoplanet in a very young disk, so relatively massive disk on a white orbit, can it avoid excessive mass growth? So it can remain as planet. And second, whether it can, uh, it can avoid fast migration, basically, whether it can be saved and not fall onto the star. So focusing on the first uh, question here, what I try to do, see if whether the radiative feedback from the protoplanet can suppress the excessive mass growth. So when you have uh, this uh, planet forming in the disk of the star, of course, you have the star here to emit some radiation. But also the, the planet itself emits some radiation. Okay, you may say, may think the planet does not have any nu uh, nuclear burning. Where does this radiation come from? It's actually due to, to accretion of gas onto the planet. So you have the planet and you have gas accreting onto the, onto the planet. So there is gas falling into the gravitational field onto the planet. So you have uh, uh, gravitational energy converted into kinetic energy. And then this kinetic energy uh, dissipates, uh, uh, is converted into heat on the accretion shock when the gas hits the surface of the planet. And because the accretion on this, at this early stage is quite high, this makes the planet, the planet quite luminous. So it can, be, has a, can have a luminosity, 10% the luminosity of the star. And actually at this stage is also the uh, uh, radiation from the star is also due to accretion of gas. At this stage that I'm discussing here, the pre, it's a pre-main sequence phase. So a nuclear burning still is not happening within the star. So here I have one of the simulations with uh, where I uh, included radiative feedback from the planet. Uh, on the left-hand side is the surface density. On the right-hand side is the temperature uh, of, the, of the disk and the planet. So you can see, in this case, I have a, a model where the uh, um, uh, feedback, radiative feedback from the planet is episodic. So the planet is, is heated uh, uh, at uh, various intervals. I'm not going to go into the detail why I choose uh, episodic feedback, but OK, let me play it again. As you can see, every now and then, the planet lights up and heats more or less the whole disk because its, its luminosity is relatively uh, high. And by heating the whole disk, I don't mean taking it from, let's say, 10K to uh, 200 or 1,000K. I'm just taking, talking about heating the disk from 10, 20K up to 30K. And even if this, this small increase in temperature is important for stabilizing the disk and uh, altering the dynamics of the disk. So let's see if this, uh, basically my, my thought is, okay, you have a hotter region around the planet, more thermal pressure can keep gas from accreting, keep gas away from the planet. And actually this is the case, but not uh, as much as I would, uh, I would like to. So here I have mass versus time. Uh, the blue line shows the mass of the planet, of the protoplanet without radiative feedback. Actually, the planet, the protoplanet becomes a low mass star. Its mass adds up to 90 Jupiter masses here. And then if I include radiative feedback, you see that it's dropped from 90 to about 60 Jupiter masses. OK, so it, make it made a difference, at least for the first secondary object. But really, I want to make it, in order to have a planet, you need to go down to 30 Jupiter masses. So really, it, it's not, it cannot really solve the problem. For the second object, so that's for the first object that, that forms from this fragmentation. The second object is a bit more uh, uh, 
uh, it's a bit better. It may, makes a bit, uh, bit uh, more important, more prominent uh, difference. So the blue line here is again no radiative feedback. The red line and the kind of orange line here is with radiative feedback. So it it may work, but not in the general case. And this is still a quite a big problem in this in this field. People are trying to find ways to uh, stop the increase of uh, the mass of a protoplanet uh, when it forms early on in the disk. The second uh, question that I was trying to, uh, to answer is whether it can avoid fast migration. So I also did a simulation where I started with, uh, uh, with a star uh, and a disk, a relatively massive disk, 0.1 solar masses, and I put a planet in the disk at about 100 at 50 AU. And this is shows uh, the result of the simulations. So this is the surface density profile. Uh, so this is a star, this is the planet. And here, uh, this plot is on the frame that correlates with the planet. So effectively the disk moves around, but the planet stays in the same, um, in the same angle. Okay, let me try to play it again to describe a little bit. So the planet initially moves inwards. So migrate inwards but then it opens up a gap. And because it interacts with this kind of gravitationally stable edge here, it just moves a little bit outwards. So what was different with the previous simulation that we've done in this issue is that the planets who managed to open up a gap and when the planets open up a gap, then its interaction with the disk is not as strong. So it, it, it does not migrate uh, that fast. In this case, actually migrate outwards because of the presence of this uh, gravitationally uh, unstable structure here. So as initially, as basically before the gap opens, I found that the migration is, is quite fast. So this is distance from the star versus time. It goes in was very fast. And the migration time scale is comparable to what previous studies have found. But then I found that the planet opens up a gap and starts moving outwards. And effectively, basically, because you have this gravitational interaction happening with a gravitationally stable edge of the disk, it saves the planet on a relatively wide orbit. And I played a little bit with the parameters of the, of the system. So I changed the, the type, how, how viscosity, how big is the viscosity. I put the planet with an inclination within the disk. And in these cases, I found very pretty similar results. So these are these three lines up here, inward migration initially, and then outward migration, very slow outward migration. The only case that was uh, different from the rest was the one that I included radiative feedback from the planet. In this case, the inward migration continues for a longer time and then switches to a, a slower migration. So going from a type one migration, as you call it, the fast migration to a type two migration. So migration without a gap in the disk to migration with a gap in the disk. And let's compare now these two cases together. So it's with radiative feedback, without radiative feedback here, with radiative feedback here. So in the case with radiative feedback, the heating from the planet hits the disk, so it makes it stable. So you don't see this structure here. And the planet moves inwards, uh, facilitates um, accretion of the inner gas Onto the, onto the star and creates a cavity around the star. Effectively, what the planet does here, it just separates the inner region of the disk from the outer region of the disk. And then accretes slowly from this, from this outer disk. But this process takes quite a long time. So this is a very long, uh, uh, long lived uh, uh, configuration of the system. And then I also checked out to see how uh, protoplanets uh, um, uh, grow in, uh, within the disk. Um, again, the starting from one Jupiter mass planet quickly grows to 13 Jupiter masses and then slowly increases to uh, 20 to 30 Jupiter masses or in the brown dwarf regime here to big mass to finally consider a planet. And then, uh, in the, but in the case with radiative feedback, the uh, mass growth is a bit uh, lower. So the planet 
the protoplanet is between the boundary between planets and brown dwarfs. So under set of conditions, you actually may end up with a planet here too. Um, okay, I think I'll skip this one. And what I did, I uh, just put planets at different uh, distances in the disk and just try to see any patterns in the behavior, the migration behavior. So I found that planets that are, planets that are, are put in the outer uh, edge, uh, region of the disk, so 50 and 80 AU here, they migrate inwards and then outwards, whereas planets that are put closer to the star migrate um, uh, inwards a little bit faster at the beginning and then much, much slower, more or less the orbit is stabilized around the central star. And that's because here, when you're close to the star, the temperature is, of the disk is higher. So the disk is not gravitationally stable. So you don't see these spiral structures that I, I, I showed you before. So the, the planet just opens up a gap. It actually opens up a gravity and resides within this cavity. And then I also check out the mass. Again, I see a dual behavior. Things that are put, planets that are put further out, they increase the mass by a lot. Whereas planets that are put close to the star, they don't increase uh, as much in mass. Which is a bit counterintuitive because the density of the disk is closer to the star. Whereas the further away you go, um, the, uh, the less mass you have, the less gas you have for, for, disk, for planets to accrete. But what happens here in this region, in this, uh, when the planet is close to the star, it opens up a cavity and resides, resides within the cavity. So basically just uh, by doing so, it delays its growth by a really long time. And trying to connect these uh, simulations with observations, I uh, showcase here three typical uh, uh, cases uh, that happen uh, at different uh, uh, stages during the formation uh, of the planets. The first one you could have is a planet within a gravitationally stable disk. So you have these spiral arms that feed the planet with gas. The gas accretion is quite large and the planet is quite luminous, exactly because it accretes a lot of material. This phase is quite short-lived. So although the planet is luminous, it's quite easy to see if, if, if in terms of uh, sensitivity, but really it, it lasts for a very short period of time. So you have to be very lucky to, to catch the planet at this stage. Then you have the bit uh, longer uh, phase, uh, longer lived phase, have a planet opening up a gap and residing within the gap. Uh, the planet still accretes in this case. There are this, maybe you just see, it, there is this kind of arm that feeds the planet with gas here. Uh, the planet is relatively luminous, uh, but again, this phase does not last as long. The longest, longest lasting phase is this one that you have a planet within the cavity. But in this case, unfortunately, the planet does not uh, accrete much. Uh, so it's not uh, very luminous. So it's very hard to see it in terms of sensitivity. And there are many disks that have shown these inner cavities uh, uh, that are indicative of planets, but uh, it's very difficult to actually confirm the presence of the planet within, within such a cavity. And to a very kind of good stage at the moment in terms of observations, so actually you can see planets as they're forming within the disks. So here is an observation uh, from a system called PDS-70. So what you have here is a clump, which is supposedly a planet at a distance about uh, 20 astronomical units from the central star. Okay, you can see the disk here. Okay, you have to be a little bit imaginative here as this is not a simulation. So there is a gap here and there is kind of a spiral arm, a kind of an arm that feeds the planet from gas from the disk. Since the first discovery, there were kind of more, uh, more observations of the, of the system that showed the presence of a second planet in the top here. Okay, and apart from seeing these clumps, there are signs of uh, H-alpha emission. And its alpha emission is a characteristic of accretion of gas uh, onto an object, which in this case is a planet. And the most recent observations of the system just came out, came out a couple of, uh, a few months ago. Uh, so even higher resolution, you can actually see the planet. So okay, this is the planet uh, C here, this one here. That shows basically that this planet also has a disk around it. And this 
where supposedly moons like uh, our moon or Jupiter's moons can form. Yeah, how am I doing with time? Um, okay, maybe I'll just quickly skim over it. I don't have that much time. Um, in the last uh, couple of years or so, I've been uh, focusing on uh, uh, red dwarfs, planet formation around red dwarfs. So these are very low mass stars, mass below 50% the mass of the, of the sun. Um, and actually many of these stars have planets. So here is the planets uh, in this box, the planets around uh, red dwarfs. Uh, you can see a quite big fraction, about 20% of these planets are relatively massive. So you have a planet that's about 10 Jupiter mass up here, orbiting around a hundred Jupiter mass a star. So the ratio between planet, the mass ratio between planet and star is quite large. And again, these planets, these very massive planets are very difficult to form by the standard uh, theory of, of planet formation. So what I try to, to see is whether you can form this planet by disk fragmentation, uh, an upper form uh, kind of an ensemble of uh, 27 simulations. Okay, this is uh, one of the simulations. Again, even if the, the star is small and the disk is again smaller than the previous case, you have these spiral arms forming that break up to form this, these objects here. So my target was first to determine the conditions for fragmentation around uh, uh, red dwarfs, and second, to determine the properties of the planets that are formed this way. So what I found, what we found is that the we need a relatively high uh, disk to stellar mass ratio to form these planets. Uh, so this is giving the disk radius here versus the disk to stellar mass radi ratio for different metallicities. So if you go to low metallicities or even to solar type metallicities here, you need the disk to be at least from 30 to 40% the mass of the star, which is relatively large. But I think there are, uh, there are clues from observations that initially at least the disks uh, around red dwarfs could be that massive. Uh, in order to determine the properties of these planets, of these protoplanets, what I did is I just follow the evolution of these little clumps that form within the, uh, within the spiral arms. And I think it's, it's quite interesting to um, discuss that this fragmentation effectively forms planets the same way that fragmentation, gas fragmentation from stars. So you have gas collapsing. If you have a small amount of gas, you form a planet. If you have a higher mass of gas, you form a star. But the physical processes are exactly the same. And this is demonstrated in this graph where I plot the density at the center of the clump or the center of the cloud if you're talking about a solar mass object. So the red line here shows what happens when you have a collapsing one solar mass cloud, one solar mass core. Okay, so initially you have the collapse proceeding more or less isothermally when the cloud is optically thin. So the temperature is about 10K. Then at about 10 to the minus 12 grams per cubic centimeter, the uh, cloud becomes optically thick. So the first hydrostatic core forms. So a radiation is uh, trapped, it cannot escape. The temperature at the center increases. I'm going up here. And then when you reach about 2000K here, molecular dissoci uh, hydrogen dissociates, and that basically just consumes quite a lot of the energy. And then you have the, the second collapse, the second collapse that effectively, uh, in the case of this one solar mass core forms a star. So the red line is for the one solar mass core and the cyan lines here, kind of it's, it's a band because I have plotted here the results for many fragments. So is what happened when you have the collapse of this Jupiter, a few, a few tens of Jupiter mass uh, clumps. So again, you have uh, isothermal collapse, then first core forms, and then second collapse and second core forms here. And actually what's important, we need to have a very good resolution in the simulations uh, to resolve what happens in these little clumps. So in this case, I had about 100,000 particles, SPH particles uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in these little clumps. This shows uh, the densities of uh, 
I think I plot here about 10 of these clumps. So the density is flat. Okay, this is logarithmic scale, it's flat in the middle, drops as r to the minus two. Um, and you see the temperatures are quite high initially uh, at the center, about 10,000 K. Okay, it's, it's pretty hot for the planet, but that's what happens when molecular, when gravitational energy uh, uh, hits, it's converted into, into heat, into, into the core. Uh, and actually this uh, result uh, uh, shows that the temperatures inside, the, uh, inside these clumps are very similar to what we expect from planets that are formed by core accretion. So the two models give comparable, um, uh, give similar properties for the objects, for the properties uh, of the planets. Okay, but you see that it's 10,000 10, K at the center of, of the clump, at the center of the protoplanet, but very quickly drops to about 10 K uh, at about 10 astronomical units. And again, also need to mention that this is a very short lit phase. So basically the planet after it forms, it will cool relatively fast. Uh, so it wouldn't, it would be a, quite difficult to observe a planet at this, at this uh, very high luminous state. Okay, and this is uh, what I, uh, what I uh, calculated for the properties of the first core and the second core. So the first core, you can see the kind of the bit loose, a bit less bound uh, structure. So some of it, it can be uh, uh, leave the planet if, if there are some tidal interactions, for example. So this varies from five to 20 Jupiter masses and the actual mass depends on the metallicity that is given different color, the color here. So low metallistic cores have, uh, generally have lower masses. And actually, as you see it, they form closer to the star. So the x-axis here is the distance from the star. And the second core, again, you have uh, masses from uh, two to, to five Jupiter masses, uh, which is what is expected uh, from the opacity uh, limit for fragmentation. So you cannot have anything formed below that mass. So although this fragmentation, this instability can produce planets, it can only give you gas giant planets and cannot form a terrestrial planets. Okay, so after I calculated this, uh, these properties, these masses and this uh, radii, I just put them in the graph of the observed exoplanets. So the black dots here are the observations, the colored ones are what I, I get from the simulations. So as expected, uh, this, uh, uh, Planets, these protoplanets, occupy the wide orbit high mass um, part of this diagram. Uh, and the stars here correspond to the first cores, sorry, the, the second cores, the more bound cores, and the circles here to the uh, uh, first cores. So it is expected that maybe some mass can be lost from this uh, second course, first course, but not from this, this course. But of course, what I have here is what I, we have from the simulations would give you what happens when the planets form or a few, maybe a couple of thousand years after they form. The observations correspond to the final state of the planets. And there's a lot of things that can happen to these planets that are still in the, in the disk. They can migrate inwards or outwards, as I discussed. They can also grow in mass, so they can move upwards in this graph or they can also lose mass. There is a theory the last couple of, well, a few years now, five years have been discussed. Uh, it's called the tidal tower sizing, according to which these clumps can actually lose quite a lot of their mass due to tidal interactions so that the planets that they form eventually are a much lower mass than what they, what they started with. And that's what I'm basically I'm focusing now. My work is focusing just trying to develop models to follow the evolution of these planets self persistently within the, their disks. And we have a lot of uh, things coming up. Uh, so you've heard about the James Webb Space Telescope that finally uh, went up after many years of delays, kind of in uh, Christmas, uh, Christmas Day um, uh, in 2000, uh, 2001. And to now we uh, slowly going from the kind of a tra tra transition in terms of observations from observing planets to actually uh, characterize them. So learn more about their chemical composition. 
and that's with uh, with what James Webb Space Telescope will do. Uh, some of the planets will be observed directly, so you can get information about the atmosphere, but the majority of the planets will use what is called transmission spectroscopy. So what we will observe is stellar light that has passed through the planet atmosphere and reached the telescope. And by absorption lines observed in the spectrum, we can get information about the composition of the uh, of these exoplanets. And M dwarfs, the, the red dwarfs that I have discovered that my, my research is focused lately, will be prime um, targets for this uh, telescope and similar telescopes like Plato and, and Cheops. And that's because M dwarfs with gas giant planets are much easier to observe. So you have the effect of, of, the, of the planet on the star is, is much greater. So you have better chance to observe the light of the star that passes from the atmosphere of the planet. So what I'm trying to do now is uh, incorporate some chemical composition, chemical evolution models in hydrodynamic simulations to try to predict the properties of this, uh, this instability planets. And I would like to leave you with my summary. Uh, there are about 5,000 exoplanets that have been discovered so far. Most of them have been discovered uh, indirectly. And I think the most important thing to, to remember is that the properties are, are quite diverse. Uh, there may be, uh, uh, I mean, we have to, to think that solar systems, out, exosolar systems are, are much different than our solar system. And they're actually, maybe they're no, may, there may not be a pattern in the, in the way this uh, exo, exoplanetary system look. There are two ways to form uh, planets. Uh, the standard theory, which is the core accretion, and may take a bit too long. Uh, and also the this fragmentation that I'm working on that give you planets very fast, but there are a bit questions whether they can actually this method can actually work in uh, in uh, to give you the planets that we observe today. But again, there may be this. I don't think these two mechanisms are exclusive of one another. You may have planets forming by discrimination. You can also have fragments, fragments forming by planets forming by core accretion. Um, I think it's uh, I've shown that this fragmentation can actually happen solar type stars, but are also around smaller uh, mass stars like M dwarfs. But there are still quite a few uh, issues to 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 worry about, and I'm continuing my work, more work, and. Uh, myself and other people, or trying to determine self-consistently the evolution of the protoplanets, so we can make uh, better comparisons with the observed properties of the exoplanets, and also to uh, determine what is the chemical composition of these key stability planets, again, to compare with uh, observations that are about to come in the next uh, decade or so. So it's a very exciting time to do uh, uh, work in this field, and I'm sure we're going to have many, uh, many important discoveries in the very near future. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, really very interesting talk. Um, the subject is uh, exciting indeed. There is time for questions. Uh, let me start. I want to go to some technical details from what I understood the uh, the code, the, the method that you use in the simulation is SPH, right? That's right, yes. It's, it's right. So, uh, uh, can you, and the, the, the gas is isothermal, or how, how these, uh, the initial conditions are in an isothermal disk? Uh, no, no, the gas, uh, we, 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 we assume a density profile for the disk and also a temperature profile for the disk. Okay. So the temperature drops as you go further away from, from, from the star. And there is some radiative transfer in the code. So basically the temperature is computed self-consistently um, within the simulations. As, as so there is evolve. heating from like gravitational collapse. There's also heating from viscous forces. And there's also right. cooling. Very nice. And uh, uh, does this uh, artificial viscosity parameter of SPH play any role? Do you have it... Uh, um, you know, try, we try not to discuss about it. Yeah, it's, a, it's quite an important thing. We hope that we have minimized viscosity, artificial viscosity in these situations. So what are the alpha-vita parameters that you use? We use the standard one, like uh, 
uh, alpha one and beta equals two. Okay. Um, but we, we use a method, uh, it's called the Balsalar switch, yes. where we switch the viscosity off where it's not needed, I or see. at least we believe we do. Yeah. So we minimize viscosity where it's not needed. And when you have uh, colliding flows, then uh, you switch on the viscosity. And the number of SPH particles that you use in the simulation is what? Uh, typically, it's about a few million particles from a two to, particles. I think we've done about two to four million particles. I see. I see. Very, very nice. So uh, initially, uh, in the very beginning, the spirals that are developed are kind of density waves propagating the disk and then they form clumps, is, is it correct? Density? That's right, exactly, yes. Yeah, okay. okay. And could it, there be any uh, uh, codependencies? Uh, I mean, in SPH, uh, well, one of the weak points of the method is that if you got a clump, you cannot get rid of that. So you have, so can there be over densities that will not be developed, let's say by a Eulorian code or something, if you use it? Uh, I mean, if you have enough resolution, uh, there's no problem about that, no problem. so. So what we, what we try to do is resolve what is called the, the tumor mass, or, or mm. kind of, which is effectively the same as the gene mass. So you have the mass, uh, basically 50 particles, which define you the, define the resolution in SPH, should contain mass less than the gene mass. And we're kind of, we could, we were basically way below this limit. So we have very good resolution. And also what's important in the simulation is you need to have uh, enough resolution to be able to resolve the vertical disk scale height. So the disk is very thin mm -hmm. uh, and that's the main problem in, in the simulation. So you have to go to a few million particles and even then you resolve the, the vertical uh, 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 scale of the disk only by a few smoothing lengths. So, so it's still, that's I think, the main worry here, not the whether you, the clumps actually form or not. Okay, very nice. So let me see if there is any question in the... Okay, a question from a non-expert. Uh, where is the hydrogen? I mean, uh, where did the hydrogen go? That's one question. The other is, do magnetic fields play a role? They seem to play a role in the collapse of the interstellar cloud mm -hmm. that forms this proto, proto stellar disk, whatever. So, okay, so is there a magnetic uh, field and where is the hydrogen? Where is the hydrogen? hydrogen, I mean, the hydrogen is there. We don't do any chemical evolution. So we start with 80% uh, hydrogen, 20% helium or something like that. And it just remains the same there. So it doesn't go anywhere. The hydrogen is still there. So your simulations have hydrogen. They, they don't lose any mass. No, no, they don't, don't convert anything to and when, so when, just when, hydrogen. When does the hydrogen disappear from, from, the, from an actual system? Oh, basically, when the disk disappears, it just stays there. And, uh, whatever, I mean, until the end of the simulation, until, uh, sorry, until the end of the evolution, until the disk dissipates from photo evaporation, so it's heated and eventually goes away, it's just hydrogen, basically. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nice. And the second, yeah, magnetic fields are important. Actually, there's been a lot of work uh, of cloud collapse with magnetic fields. And there is a problem there that if you put magnetic fields, it's very difficult to form a disk. Um, initially, the first simulations were done with ideal MHD that didn't form disks at all. But then uh, as uh, simulations have involved, methods have involved and put the non-ideal terms, some dissipation and uh, the whole effect and everything. And people start forming disks now. And again, with magnetic fields, you can make disk fragmentation a bit harder. Um, so they may play an important role, but really, we're not sure about it. One more question. The stage when you have the jets that you showed in the Yeah, yeah that's stage. definitely driven by, that's, that these are driven by magnetic fields. So that, that's the consensus that it's magnetic. And yeah, yeah. there are no jets in your simulation. All that has died out before you start. No, no, they're, they're not jets because there's no magnetic fields in the simulation. And what, what is the role of these jets? What do they do in the system? Uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, well, not in detail. Do they, do they, do they lose of, mass? Or, uh, I don't know. Yeah, 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 of course they lose mass. About 10% of the mass that goes into the star is ejected. Okay. Um, and also they carry, the most important thing is that they carry angular momentum away. Okay. So they, 
for the gas to accrete onto the star, you need to lose angular momentum. And this, this, uh, these jets just carry angular momentum away from the disk. But then the field disappears somehow. Yeah. Yeah, eventually, yeah. I mean, yeah. Eventually, yeah. I think that's primordial field, right? It's, so when the density drops, then the field also dissipates too. Okay. Any other question from the audience in the room? If not, I see uh, probably Mirella has raised his hand from home. No? No. And is there any other question here? Here, I don't see any other question here. So, if uh, if I have uh, missed something, please uh, just uh, unmute and speak. If there is any question, if not, uh, okay, one more question from this. This pictures, just thermal emission. Uh, it's kind of a sub-millimeter emission. So yeah, just, yeah. Just thermal, just thermal. Just thermal, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just, yeah, just uh, basically long, long wavelength emission due to the increasing temperature of this disk, which is very, very low. Yes, okay. Have you considered the double systems where you have two stars, two pores forming? Uh, yeah. uh, in terms of migration, actually, I have now a master student that is working on this. Has, she has put two stars here and just try to see if the migration patterns are a bit different. Um, binary stars make things a bit messier. <laughs> so they, uh, okay, if you put the stars too close together, they don't have a big effect on the disk. But if you, even if you put the stars, let's say, at five astronomical units, then they excite their own density waves in the disk, so it becomes a bit chaotic. So it's a, it's a bit different, to, difficult to parameterize, but I think it's, it, things are, are quite different in, in binary systems. How, how close are stars in binary systems from observations? 100 uh, AUs, 1,000 AUs, uh, actual binary systems? Yeah. I think the average is about uh, 50 AU, the average separation of, of binaries. So why don't you put them at 50 or 100 AU? Uh, the problem is, I mean, if you put them at 50 AU, then uh, basically they will destroy the disks. So you're not going to have a disk to form planets. So indeed, if you have this type of binaries, uh, then you don't have, you cannot have planets around any type of binaries. So you can, if you have a very close binary, let's say separation about one AU, then you can have a circumbinary disk where you can form the planets. If you have very wide binaries, again, you can have individual disks around the stars that you can form planets in these individual disks. But if you have something like 50 AU, basically the disk is destroyed, so you don't have enough time to, to form planets. Is that consistent with observations? All the planets are seen in single star systems? No, there are a few binaries, but again, there are other planets around a very tight binary or, okay, okay. or around individual or stars in binary, yeah. What? Yeah, there is a there is some work kind of develop uh, kind of that had determined the stability zone around binary systems, and there is an exclusion zone okay. that you cannot there have. There have been found uh, discovered uh, planets in uh, Proxima Centauri, which is a yeah. more complicated system, not just double. So that there are, and uh, but they're very far. The stars are very far. Well, it's uh, it's a, a, a three four uh, stars uh, four stars, I think, that uh, orbit each other, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Actually, uh, the the first one of the first studies of uh, stability of orbits for also with an application to habitable zones back in '65 was done by a gnome. <laughs> okay, there is one more question from the audience here. Of course, this Gondikakis is asking before Yanis uh, Kondopoulos were asking, and now it's Costis Gondikakis. Cases where you have a wind of the central object that interacts Speak with up. the... Speak up, because... Yeah. Can we have the case of a wind emerging from the central object that interacts with the, with the disk? Uh, we don't include that, but in this case, I mean, the, the wind will be, uh, for this type of stars, it's going to be very, uh, very low mass, so I don't think it makes a, a difference here. 
uh, and I have a final question. Maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, the the succession of uh, gaps and rings uh, can be related to some kind of resonances on this disk. Uh, they seem to change from disk to disk, and uh, no resonance have been found uh, for this. Because you, you do, okay, maybe you can explain one disk, but you have uh, now you have many disks, so yeah. no consistent theory has been uh, uh, formed. It's for mainly these. because the some a plant has been formed, and then the mm -hmm. area empties, and then is that's the kind of the most uh, usual uh, explanation. Yeah. But again, if you have so many planets in the system. They're going to interact with each other and also interact with the disk, so something is missing there. But you uh, showed one simulation with circular orbits. You had one planet, and you had this bright, this dark rings in mm -hmm. in one of your simulations. So one planet, and yet you had many yes, dark yes, zones. Yes. So it was kind of a resonance or something there. Mm -hmm. or, yeah, this one. If you, if you, I mean, maybe it wasn't easy to see. Basically, it was just a spiral, just going around and around like that. So it wasn't separate rings. But yeah, there, there have been some kind of theories that suggest. It, it, it if you show, it, can you show us the plot? You had three three panels. The central yeah, one. Yeah. Had... That one there. Yeah. You see, if you blow, if yeah, you yeah. This up, there are rings there, and you have one planet, many rings. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if you see it, it's just basically it's once this spiral is just going around and it's but maybe ah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. It's going like that. It's a spiral. Okay, thank you. It's not here, it's 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 kind of a it's not that pronounced as you see in the observation. So it's okay, easily the okay. pickup for ripple. Very but also there be some uh, people that say there is some what they call secular gravitational instabilities that form these rings in the in the in these systems that can last for a long time. But I don't think there is a consensus about what forms is it. There is a, kind of the, the first interpretation is that are planets, but something is not quite right there. As you see here, the planet forms a lot of rings, or you have these more stronger interactions, but there we just have these rings very, very well defined without mm -hmm. any signs of mm -hmm. quite spherical, quite symmetrical, which is a bit, uh, a bit strange. Very nice, very nice. Let me final check here. Maybe I miss oh, but this was said, okay. Right here is no guy. Okay. Then if there are no more questions, then thank the speaker again. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you very much. You. It was very nice to have uh, you with us and uh, see you. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Have a good day. Bye bye. Για τον Κωνσταντίνο το κλείνουμε τώρα τι κάνει ηχογραφία ακόμα, τι κάνει. Όχι, δεν είμαι στην κουρούσα, ρώτησε τον γιατί με τον Μανώλη είχαμε πάντα πρόβλημα. Μην το κόψω γιατί ο Μανώλης μου λέει κόφτω, αλλά τώρα ο προφανώς ο Κωνσταντίνος έχει τα δικά του τώρα. Recording λέει εκεί.